Good day to all of you. Welcome to another, um, another episode of Biotherapy Live. Today's guest is Dr. Ekholm Fry. She is the director of equine programs at the Institute for Human Animal Connection at the University of Denver, where her work encompasses therapeutic human horse interactions and equine behavior and welfare. She is an adjunct professor in the Graduate School of Social Work and the Graduate School of Professional Psychology. And she leads the Postmasters Equine Assisted Mental Health Practitioner Certificate Program. We will hear more from Dr. Ekholm Fry after the introductory video. Take it away, Albert. Welcome everyone. This is a very exciting program uh, today because we're joined by Dr. Ekholm Fry, who coordinates the Human Animal Environment Interactions in Social Work Certificate within the Denver campus um, Masters of, Science, of Social Worker program. For the past 15 years, she has focused on horses in human services, specializing in inclusion of equine interactions in psychotherapy and counseling. She has a particular interest in applied ethics and social justice perspectives within human animal interactions, including human horse conflict. Dr. Ekholm Fry has a background as a psychotherapist as a competitive writer, as an equine behavior consultant, and as an academic professional and speaker actively engaged with national and international organizations for both human and equine health. For example, Dr. Equine, um, Ekholm Fry, uh, not equine, uh, Dr. Ekholm Fry is the vice president of the American Hippotherapy Association, the immediate past co-chair of the certification board for equine interaction professionals, and serves as the chief editor of the Hetty Journal International Research and Practice, published by the International Federation of Horses in Education and Therapy, Hetty. Among her many publications, is the many, many publications is the chapter on equine assisted therapy, which I happen to have here because it's in Martin Grossberger's uh, book, uh, reference book on biotherapy, history, principles, and practice. And uh, we're very happy to have uh, that contribution. So without further delay, uh, please, Dr. Back home, Fry, welcome. And we are very excited to hear uh, all about um, what you've been doing and what you see coming, coming, uh, coming along with it. Wonderful. It's great to be here at the Biotherapy Live Talk. And as I mentioned, I've participated in that volume on biotherapy and have some knowledge 
of the various areas um, in, in this field. But as was mentioned, my area has to do with the inclusion of animal interactions in mostly human healthcare services, but also in other services. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to focus on horses. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And folks, let me know if this is all right. Yes. All right. So we'll be talking about horses in human health, uh, focusing on horses, but I also work with other species and in various areas, such as social work and I'm a psychologist myself. And uh, I work at the Institute for Human Animal Connection, uh, which was mentioned earlier. We're an institute at University of Denver. We uh, work in two primary areas in education. Um, so that means uh, kind of public education, professional development, and we also conduct research. And we engage students at University of Denver in um, these endeavors as well. We're a, a fairly large institute when it comes to human animal interaction related institutes. And you heard a little bit about my background. I work in both human health and equine health, and also on the kind of comparative area between them. Um, now, again, we're going to focus on human health and the inclusion of horses in those areas. And doing so, we're going to look at um, a few different examples or a few different areas of this. The first one uh, will be physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech language therapy or pathology. What do these professionals do with horses in their work? We're also going to look at psychotherapy and mental health counseling, my area. What do mental health professionals do uh, with horses? We're gonna look at education and learning, coaching, facilitation. This is a bit of a broader area or, or bucket, so to speak, of, of services. Um, we'll look more at how horses appear there as well. And finally, we're gonna look at something called adaptive riding and horsemanship. This is also known as therapeutic riding um, in the United States. And I should clarify that when I'm talking about terms, I'm talking specifically about the United States um, because terms and terminology is a tricky thing, especially in this uh, area. And different countries use different terms uh, to mean different things. So adaptive and therapeutic writing mean the same thing. And to top it off, I will talk about horses as part of volunteer visit settings and horses as service animals. And I have to apologize in advance. I'm, I'm coming out of a cold here. I can feel a little tickle in my throat. I apologize if I need to clear my voice here at any point. So let's get started. Physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech language therapy, speech language pathology, these professionals, these therapists and their assistants make use of horses or more specifically horse movement in the provision of these healthcare services. So what does this mean or look like? So use of equine movement, movement of the horse, the person is typically placed then on top of the horse, uh, is referred to as hippotherapy uh, in the United States. It's important to know though that hippotherapy simply refers to a treatment tool the movement of the horse that's used within physical therapy. It is thus not a separate kind of thing. It's really what the physical or occupational or speech language pathologists use uh, as one of many treatment tools when they're providing services and thus can you know, bill insurance because they're doing physical therapy. Um, and again, equine movement and hippotherapy, those terms can be used interchangeably. And here we have one of those terms, hippotherapy, that's used so differently internationally. So it's important to, again, place the context on, we're talking about the United States. Um, I have a, a short video here to show a little bit about the biomechanical influence. It's about a minute long um, from the horse's movement on the human body. This is from Central Michigan University. Biomechanical influence. Biomechanically, a walking horse imparts motion to the person sitting on its back. 
each step the horse takes causes the horse's pelvis to move in a multi-dimensional pattern, such as anterior posterior pelvic tilt, ventral and dorsal rotation around the spine, and lateral flexion of the horse's spine. The horse's pelvic movement is in turn translated to multi-dimensional movement of the individual. This multi-dimensional movement of the horse facilitates the contraction of the patient's core muscles of the trunk, as well as pelvic girdle and cervical spine to develop a dynamic postural stability. Proximal stability enables distal mobility. Improved trunk control provides a stable foundation to support upper and lower extremity functional activities. It is also thought that the repetitive rotation of the individual's pelvis around the horse's spine may provide some reflex inhibiting properties that help decrease tone in spastic muscles and facilitates dissociation of the pelvis from the trunk. Bio so here we saw in action the impact of the horse's movement on the human body. So that's really what these professionals in this area um, do. They skillfully manipulate the movement of the horse because of the neuromotor input that's provided from the horse onto the human body. It's multidimensional, different sideways, up and down, <laughs> you know, forwards and back and it's multimodal at an average rate of 100 beats per minute. So that means a lot of neuromotor inputs uh, per therapy session. And then this is, again, something that the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, or the speech language pathologists make use of as sort of a, a background activity, like the neuromotor input assists them in applying other treatment tools and the clinical approach overall that they're taking to treatment. And you'll hear me emphasize over and over again that especially when it comes to healthcare, that we don't consider in human health and in this manner, we don't consider the horse some sort of special alternative or different treatment. We really look at um, the interactions with the horse, the movement of the horse as one of the treatment tools or techniques that a, that a therapist can use in the course of their work. And that is up to them to decide what treatment techniques and tools they use if they have competency in providing them. And here again, there's other examples of, of similar dynamic movement tools are balls and, and trampolines, but the horse really provides a unique kind of neuromotor input on the human body. And the therapist here, again, skillfully manipulates the movement. It's not riding. It's not just being on a horse. It's the therapist that grades go slower, faster, tempo, tilt, uh, depending on that client's specific needs. And this makes it much different than if you and I go for a horseback ride, for instance. Um, and then this is just a little more about you know, PTOT speech speak, um, what they might, how they think about it. Postural motor, motor responses, vestibular activation could help with visual input and of course, input to the central nervous system. And then this becomes the basis of that professional applying their treatment principles um, in conjunction with this. So that was our little speed through of area number one. And we're now going to area number two in healthcare. So meaning treatment, psychotherapy, and mental health. So this is in my area. And as was mentioned, at University of Denver, we have a post-master's program in um, including horses, specifically in psychotherapy. So similar thinking here, but different area of healthcare. Here we talk more about horse interaction. So this is less visual than you know, what we see in, in let's say physical therapy, the movement, the treatment is, is visually kind of accessible. But when we're talking about things like psychotherapy, a psychological process, that's part of treating mental uh, illness, emotional conditions, um, you know, challenges to, to well-being that arise psychologically. This is not as visually striking, perhaps, but no, not, not less important. So here we talk about use of horse interactions. 
and the setting to the outdoor nature setting as part of providing psychotherapy or counsel. This is sometimes referred to as equine assisted psychotherapy or equine, ther equine assisted therapy, although it's not a separate therapy approach. And that can make terminology in this area be a little tricky because doesn't it sound like it's a separate thing when in fact, this is a psychotherapy session. The therapist should rely on common factors of psychotherapy, well-researched factors in treatment outcomes, such as the quality of the therapeutic alliance between the, the therapist and the client. So including horses and interactions with them, equine assisted psychotherapy, it's not a separate therapy approach. It's not a modality either. And I know that this is an important word for folks interested in biotherapy. This is also not a strategy nor a standalone intervention. So in other words, it's not that petting the horse is, some is somehow, you know, treating you, but it's really how the therapist skillfully makes use of the elements that arise from interactions with horses as part of their therapeutic approach. And if you think about the setting of being in psychotherapy, there's still some stigma around mental health, more so than physical health that we saw earlier. And the idea of sitting with somebody emotionally, sharing things with them, even if they're a professional, can really be a barrier for many to seek services. But what if those services are in an outdoor setting? What if they include interactions with other animals that the therapist makes use of toward your treatment goals? That to me sounds like a much better deal. So experiential, relational, and somatic elements, somatic related to the soma, the body, uh, are then included. And here we just I have an overview here of, of some of the many elements that a psychotherapist, a mental health practitioner may make use of in their treatment environment, their therapeutic environment, when horses are there. Everything from the setting itself, the opportunity to move around, not sit statically as you're processing emotional content, or as you're experiencing, let's say, memory reconsolidation, which is a phase of trauma treatment. There's a lot of opportunity for something unique here, caregiving behaviors. We're naturally wired as social mammals, which horses are too, um, toward caretaking. And we get natural chemical rewards from this action. But for some humans, this is not so easy with other humans. There might not be opportunity to caretake others, or it might not feel appropriate. But we might still have that, um, receive those neurochemical uh, positive consequences from this and really enhance the therapeutic setting. And again, there's more and other examples. One important one is also self-regulatory opportunities that are practical and in the moment. It's not just so much talking, but also doing when it comes to guiding the mind and our overall mental health and wellness. And something that I have personally noticed um, has been a huge benefit to me as a therapist, including horses in my work and working in an outdoor setting, has been the opportunity for silence and pauses in the therapy process. It can be a lot to have a therapy session for 60 minutes, 50 minutes, 45 minutes, and just be there with the therapist in that room. It's a little hard to take a natural break. Um, and a lot of things are happening inside you, even though you can typically sit just in an office just like this. So when you're outside, you're interacting with an animal like the horse, specifically versatile, large, warm to the touch, a social mammal who's interested in interactions, having those opportunities for silence and pauses has been really valuable to me in terms of structuring uh, treatment. And I'm trained uh, in trauma treatment. So that is a little bit about uh, the psychotherapy realm and how horses appear there. They appear as, their, as themselves, as the species that they are. The um, second to last category I'll, I'll touch on here has to do with education, learning, coaching, facilitation. This becomes this sort of, again, broad bucket of services that are not therapy or treatment, but are still 
you know, serving the individual in terms of academic or scholastic learning, or in terms of learning about oneself. So social emotional skills learning, uh, life coaching, uh, things like this. And again, similarly, the use of horse interactions are included in the way a person work. Perhaps a person is a business coach or executive coach, or they're a life coach, and that's the service that they provide. Then they include horse interactions to enhance that service, to bring those experiential, tangible examples to that person's life, mostly in a relational sphere, because we do practice our own relational skills together with other animals. We are not typically that different, even though we might think so, in our relationships with human animals and with other animals. And um, educators in school settings have found that in integrating movement in, in learning, let's say spatial learning, like what is the circle? What is the diameter of it? What is the radius? How do we figure these concepts out? Not so helpful perhaps to just sit in a traditional school, school um, at a school desk and figuring that out as opposed to being experientially engaged. Um, and we also know that moving the body, whether it's on top of a horse or whether it is just moving around in general, also helps um, with learning. We have some studies about solving math, um, math challenges and, and correlated to the movement of the horse, for instance. And um, again, this looks in a, in a number of different ways. I've personally facilitated things like um, boards, you know, boards, nonprofit boards who want to have leadership development um, for their teams. Um, I've worked with social emotional learning. Um, I've provided supportive services such as resiliency focused retreats um, for uh, individuals who served in the military or who are active service members. The environment the aliveness of the horse and the relational aspects of this is really what enhances the service at hand. So this can, again, this category or area is sometimes called equine assisted learning, but the person still has to work according to learning principles that are related to humans. And here they can do more traditional horsemanship activities like teaching horses uh, skills, such as being led over obstacles, and at the same time, keeping that focus and goal on what are you learning? How are you transferring these skills? You know, really in the spirit of experiential learning theory here. Then we've talked about now three areas. These are really the areas I mentioned are really the core areas we talk about in the United States when we talk about including or incorporating horses into a kind of human service, healthcare or education. But now we get to this, this final area, and I mentioned I have a couple of more points there of, of how horses appear in different settings, but this area is now not so much about including a horse into an existing service, because when we're talking about riding and horsemanship, meaning tasks and skills together with horses, we really talk about not including the horse in that because the horse is the point. <laughs> and there exists a lot of misconceptions about what adaptive riding is and Part of it is because of the term therapeutic riding, and that term is used differently in different countries. So again, if you're watching from a different country, these, what I'm saying now is specific to the United States. So adaptive riding might make this mysterious area sound a little more clear. What we're talking about here is actually access. Access to horses, horse riding, horse activities, for people who may have a visible or invisible disability that makes it, um, that creates barriers to engaging with horses recreationally or in sport, uh, in, in other areas. Those, um, and again, this is just recapping what I'm saying. Their adaptive riding is really instruction of horsemanship and riding that's adapted to the person's ability. 
And that could be the teaching environment, how you're communicating. Maybe you're using sign language, maybe you're using visual cues, um, the techniques of how you teach, the equipment, so such as ways of getting on and off the horse, which uh, let's say a riding school down the road might not be equipped to manage if you as a human ambulate in a different way um, and, and are, are not going to be getting on the horse in a way that um, is considered a typical manner. And so this is about riding horses, enjoying them, whoever you are. And um, it's really about disability rights. When, when we think about horses and we think about riding in general, because we're contrasting this area with those healthcare areas where elements of horses are really taken and modified within a healthcare or treatment area or within education or, or scholastic learning area. The, what we're looking at here is really thinking about why do people hang around horses? Why do they care about horses? Um, why do people want to recreate with horses? Why do they want to engage in sport? Um, why do people like me have five horses uh, just over there at my home here outside of Denver? Um, we know from research that being around horses, so this is now outside of healthcare because adaptive riding is about getting access if you have a disability, um, really promotes social interactions. It tends to be a social deal, not just to be with the horse, but there tends to be other people around because of where horses live. And it tends to be at a barn or a stable and you see other people there, you could go riding together quite social. And this is capitalized too on in uh, various ways horses are included in healthcare. Generally, just being around horses means that you're typically working towards some sort of goal. It might be riding, might be driving. It might just be on the ground, you and your horse. It gives us satisfaction and direction, uh, maybe outside of our, our work um, to do so. Enjoying nature has been a strong um, kind of component in studies around why people who are around horses really enjoy this or feel a sense of connectedness. And that's because horse activities tend to take place not so much in a space like this, but in nature, in green spaces, and you tend to interact with other animal species as well. And you could even get a double whammy here of some forest bathing, uh, which I did unknowingly as a child, riding around the forests of my uh, native country, Finland, um, on, on my horse, or sometimes just walking with my horse, and really kind of getting a functional reason to get out in nature. I'd mentioned caregiving earlier. Uh, this is reported as another area of satisfaction that horse owners or people around horses rep, uh, re, you know, speak about. The, the feeling when they're brushing or grooming their horse, the feeling when they're providing hay or water um, for their horse, um, and the feeling of re reciprocity there of emotional um, feelings as well as providing for can have some really strong wellness benefits. Having, of course, relational and emotional experiences. Um, this goes without saying, we're, we're a social mammal together with other social mammals. And finally, exercise and movement. So contrasting this again from how a, a occupational therapist or physical therapist or speech language pathologist might carefully grade the kind of equine movement that provides that neuromotor input for a shorter period of time and in a certain manner, while let's say the client is rotating their body or practicing another skill with this idea of just recreating with horses. Exercise and movement, you're always um, mucking horse poop or moving stuff around or, or um, just exercise from being on horses. But we have to remember that um, for especially athletic riders, the movement of the horse can sometimes is quite highly correlated with back pain um, in humans. So it's not just any horse movement that can be used in therapy, but we know also that generally speaking, 
being around horses does give us an opportunity for exercise and movement that tends to feel good to us as a human species, man. So this is all connected to, again, the area of adaptive riding, therapeutic riding, which sounds like it's supposed to be a therapy, uh, but it's just a, a terminology misnomer. We're really talking about getting access to horses and riding in spaces that you might not otherwise, or maybe your autism isn't understood at the local riding school, and you need an instructor who can support your interests and dreams with horses um, by adapting the environment. And I kind of hit, stopped myself from going into this historical deep dive about horses in human health. Um, partly because I get very excited about this. Uh, there's a lot to say. There were uh, ancient Greeks, uh, Greek physicians talked about horses. Um, there were there were references to horse riding um, starting in the 1500s. And I just wanted to highlight from the last century, this person, this is Lise Hartel. Uh, she's a Danish, uh, was a Danish rider who was training to join the Olympics when finally men and women could compete against each other. So she was active in the 40s and 50s. And in the 50s was one of the first Olympic games happened to be in Helsinki, um, of where men and women could compete against each other. And we had also earlier set aside the requirement that you had to be a military personnel to partake in the Olympics. So now here we have Lise, who was an equine athlete and who was practicing um, dressage um, with her trainer. And then she contracted polio, which affected uh, her ability to use her body uh, as she had before, and especially her legs. And it was her trainer who said, you know, I think you should keep riding. And Lise did keep riding and um, received or, or won two silver medals in the 1950s silver medal in dressage competing internationally uh, with her polio. And this really was, was a, 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 made quite a splash and started this notion of, oh yeah, one, people with disabilities can ride horses. That's quite all right. And number two, um, maybe horse movement could be something useful. And that really we see as the kind of the impetus for the modern movement of really starting to categorize, okay, what kind of horse interaction or horse movement is used and how both in professional and medical settings, but again, also in more leisure and recreational ways. So just to finish um, this little module on, on adaptive riding, that it's really about access and adaptation to have positive experiences surrounding horses and riding. And just because you have a disability doesn't mean horses are extra super special for you. It can't be treatment unless there's a therapist present who's administering treatment based on their typically advanced degrees at master's or doctoral level. But being around horses do bring a lot of positive experiences to people's lives. The two final areas here, I'll be quite brief. I'm looking forward to hearing some questions and thoughts here. Um, the two other areas where horses appear um, sort of different structurally from what I was talking about is in volunteer visits. You might have heard of things like dogs visiting hospitals and schools and, and places like that. Well, miniature horses do the same and small ponies. So uh, organizations like Pet Partners, um, you know, qualify or train uh, teams also with humans and horses and not just humans and dogs, which we might be most familiar with. And these volunteer visits is really about sparking joy in situations where there could be some hardship, such as uh, being in a hospital, for instance. And horses can also be part in volunteer settings of um, in literacy and reading programs. So you might have heard of dogs at the library where children and youth, typically, typically children and youth, read to dogs to reduce the anxiety around reading and literacy. And you can do the same with uh, horses 
as well because they have that same relational presence. And I don't know if you all have animals or pets at home, I'm sure you talk to them and you have a quite a similar social exchange there, even to humans sometimes. Finally, uh, service animals. So again, I'm talking specifically about the United States here and how our um, legal definitions of service animals are. And it is true, in fact, that a miniature horse with specific dimensions and weight can be a service animal in the United States. Otherwise, service dogs, dogs as a species, is the only main service animal category. And a service animal is trained to perform a specific task to um, assist their person in access. And that could be access in public spaces, that could be tasks in the home as well. And so there are some, um, some application here for a, a miniature horse. It's a little trickier because the miniature horse's living environment is not inside a human house like a dog could live. So we have some, some um, modifications or challenges here in terms of the amount of need and access that they're, the, the person who has to serve this animal needs. And horses are typically then used for guide tasks and mobility and stability tasks. But they are just like dogs, uh, trained in a similar way to recognize obstacles, to listen for um, the beeping of a, of a crosswalk, you know, green signal and, and um, all of these things. The, the learning capacities of the horse are not that different, even though dogs, of course, have some features that make them excel in, in a number of things in terms of our companion animals. But horses are not that different. I won't mention this as much, but I think it's worth just sort of keep putting it out here that horses and parts of horses are also used in other areas of human health and healthcare in pharmacology, uh, pharmacology um, with some controversy, both in terms of the effects of using conjugated equine estrogens for hormone therapy or hormone replacement therapy on the recipient of that, um, typically uh, human women, um, but also in the practices surrounding the extraction of the um, conjugated equine estrogen that comes from the urine of mares, uh, female horses, who are pregnant and who thus need to be kept pregnant in order to extract that the, the CEE from their, from their urine. So this is not necessarily an area of expertise of mine. I'm happy to, to talk more about it if there's interest. So to wrap up here, horses then, this maybe mystical creature to some and to others, uh, a common friend who share the same brain structures, neurochemicals, feelings of pain, uh, stress, and also of comfort and pleasure with you, um, who are horses really? And when we talk about them in the context of human health, it's important that we don't fall into some pseudoscientific traps or we don't sort of misunderstand uh, who horses are. And horses are not a therapist. They're not mirrors. They don't understand and access human concepts like therapy. And if horses did, they would probably organize themselves and get themselves some civil rights. So we can't have one without the other, but horses and their environment provides relationship, new experiences, practice of caring, co-regulatory behaviors, touch importantly, the size and versatility of the horse make them slightly different than a dog, for instance, or a cat or a guinea pig. Movement uniquely on top of them or with them, and a sense of connectedness. So that's really what I wanted to share as an overview, and I'll leave my share screen uh, now to, to hear some questions. Well, thank you very much uh, for that informative, uh, stimulating uh, discussion. I learned uh, quite a bit from your talk, and it covered an, an extensive area 
of uh, fields, multiple fields, multiple applications. I have loads of questions and uh, hopefully we will have um, the opportunity to uh, address some of them later uh, because we won't be able to get them all down. Um, I think first we'll ask Albert if there were any questions left by some of the participants. Anything you're seeing on the, in the chat, Albert? Um, no, Dr. Sherman, not at the moment. Okay. Um, well, I wrote down a few questions in advance and you answered many of them. And the others I'm actually going to leave for a second because I had some questions from your talk. I, I prefer the questions that are prompted by what you have to say. And so the first, the first thing I'm dying to hear you tell me about is your horses. What kind, why five, what do you do with them? What do they do for you? Um, so I, I'd like to hear about that. And I had, I had snuck in photos or images of my horses throughout the presentation. So, so you actually saw some of them unknowingly. Um, so I do have five horses here ranging from a Appaloosa cross. This is an American breed, an Appaloosa tend to have spots on them. Um, he's uh, quite large and very senior. So he's comparatively with human years approaching his 90s which is a very old horse. So he's in his 30s and his name is, is Jasper. And he was actually part of a um, program that me and my graduate students ran for an organization called the Arizona Foundation for Burns and Trauma, which is sort of a psychosocial support camp for children who've experienced uh, traumatic burns and other experiences. Um, called Camp Courage. So he was part of, of those activities. And then I decided, I think he needs to come to live with me in his older days. Uh, I also have a Colorado Mustang. Um, that was the last horse you saw there when I was talking a little bit about horses. You might have noticed if you were perceptive that there was a tattoo uh, on the side of his neck. And this tattoo is given to horses who are born on, on federally managed lands, um, Bureau of Land Management lands. So he comes from a Colorado herd management area as an American Mustang and now a days lives in a more domestic setting here together with me, his name is Willy Wonka. Um, I also have um, a black and white pinto pony named Bandit. He was featured in the, psych and the psychotherapy and mental health counseling slide. Uh, he's uh, been with me for a long time and uh, he's also been part of a equine assisted learning program that a colleague of mine, um, uh, provided when I was living in Arizona. And um, I also have a horse named Shiloh. Um, and we're almost to the end. <laughs> you asked about all five. Uh, Shiloh has, uh, was a, given to me by a, a school bus driver where I used to live in Arizona and um, has been a really um, I, I use comparative health references with Shiloh a lot because he had some um, what we called adverse childhood experiences or ACEs in the human realm. Uh, he was separated from his mother. He was kept isolated. He, he didn't know how to be uh, as a horse. And as a result, has some emotional challenges at times and has some regulation issues um, that I really approach and think about, because I also do behavior consultation for horses and their owners, I think about these processes as not dissimilar to what I do as a human therapist necessarily. And finally, I have a miniature horse. Uh, her name is Penelope. And Penelope, uh, I adopted from a uh, humane society uh, who had actually contracted me to establish an equine center for behavioral rehabilitation and adoption. Um, I'm very interested in horses in transition when horses move from place to place. Um, so Penelope was part of an intake that me and our veterinarian um, 
did where we collaborated with a local family and in them surrendering some of their horses because of the lack of resources they were experiencing and honestly the lack of knowledge too. So Penelope um, and I, I sometimes refer to her, use examples with her relative to trauma and overwhelming experiences. And um, so, and, and that's been, that's been great because an area that I'm working in or interested in is the acute, acute stress symptoms in other animals and then the prolonged experience of these, which we call post-traumatic stress in humans and whether horses actually experience post-traumatic stress in particular. So those were all my horses <laughs> who are, again, over there. <laughs> How did you get involved in this um, field? And was it something that you were interested in from childhood? You liked horses, you wanted to pursue something, um, equine, yeah. uh, or something you came back to to integrate with your psychology, psychotherapy work at a later time? Yeah, great question. I, I grew up on the west coast of Finland, and I grew up uh, on a farm. Um, and I was interested in animals uh, from a young age. My family, including my grandparents on my mother's side, were very interested in cats. There was a lot of cats around. And I noticed early on that my family, as opposed to some other families in the village, would what we now call anthropomorphic speak, but would talk as if the animals were speaking in human terms. And not everybody did that who had animals in my village. And I thought a lot about this as a child. And so, and my, we had a, a boarding stable, meaning a, a place where people can have their horses and where horses could live uh, as part of this farm. So I grew up around horses and all kinds of animals and and um, mostly crops farming, uh, Timothy hay, oats, barley, that kind of thing. So I, this is how I grew up, but I also love and loved then people. And I'm very interested in, in human relationships and dynamics. So when it came time to go to formal study, I was already doing things like, at that time, riding competitively, training horses. I knew there were challenges in the horse industry in terms of people's mental health and horses' mental health as well. It's not all good when it comes to human-horse interactions uh, by any means, especially from the horse's perspective. So I decided to pursue um, psychology uh, as opposed to, let's say, a, a equine science career at that time, even though I've later on done a lot of postgraduate training um, in horse behavior and horse science. So I've been able to kind of straddle that comparative health lens um, more or less throughout my career and human animal interactions have really been an area of specialization alongside trauma. You do a lot of work in ethics. Um, can you share some of the um, some of the more specific, issues that you work with or that you see or how you can um, uh, or, or that you address or teach relative to uh, animal, human, patient, where my hand there, there are three, uh, <laughs> the triangle, um, ethics. Yes, and there's so many areas of ethics, right, when it comes to our interactions with other animals, everything from our, you know, animal testing, um, everything from, you know, animals that are performing services or labor, you know, for us in general, and also conflicts with free roaming horses, whether they're Mustangs uh, on federal lands, or whether they're non-Mustang free roaming horses, who I also have a, a particular interest in. Um, uh, I've, I've done a project in Eastern Kentucky, which happens to be one of the most under-resourced areas in human health as well uh, in the United States. And here we have things like horse car collisions, um, thing, you know, 
those kinds of conflicts of space and land. Um, but so generally speaking, right, we, we have to problematize our interactions and relationships with other, other animals, especially when we now understand more about one health and one welfare, the interconnected impact that we have. So, but if we zoom in kind of more into the inclusion of horses in, in human health services, those same principles that exist elsewhere are also present there. Um, dynamics of power, for instance, dynamics of privilege based on species and other identity markers. You know, you happen to have a horse identity, horse species identity versus a human species identity. That makes a big difference of what's going to happen in your life, uh, for instance. And even just the process of domestication of animals itself as a, as, as a kind of power move uh, could be considered if we're looking at it from this particular lens of ethics and that kind of thing. So when we're especially including horses in something as... Um, nuanced as psychotherapy, where the therapists are trained in understanding the relationship with the client or patient as a working tool, but also understand what comes with the role power that you hold as a healthcare provider, and to be careful to not cause harm through that role power. We also have to consider the impact of power when it comes to including another vulnerable population into your treatment. So you've got your clients, patients, and now you've got animals who are under your control, more or less, you know, animals don't have IRBs and I'm not considering Aya Cook as, as a, a strong animal IRB protection necessarily. Um, and animals don't have a say in lawmaking, uh, typically speaking. And there's some interesting stuff around personhood and and, and things like that around non-human animals. But anyway, in that therapy session with those dynamics, we don't wanna perpetuate the kind of harmful relationships that a human patient has had, you know, for instance, through misuse of power and just have them then sort of make the horse do something and feel a false sense of empowerment from doing that when they're just perpetuating an unhelpful uh, relational dynamic, even though at this point it's cross species. So in our post-master's program, we, we do focus on and center social justice-related concepts, such as power and privilege and oppression, and we are careful to consider them also in our other relationships when we include them into a treatment service that's not supposed to cause harm. Very good. Um, maybe we have time for just uh, one, or, one or two more questions. Albert, anything you see in the chat box? Uh, no, not, not at this moment. Okay. Um, well, I want to give the opportunity for participants and listeners to ask questions. So if you're watching this as a recorded uh, video, by all means, um, contact us uh, if you have any questions uh, or put comments in the Facebook or YouTube um, conversation uh, if you have uh, questions and we'll try and, and get, get to those as well. Then maybe I'll take the, uh, the uh, luxury of asking another question. Um, what do you know about the status of reimbursement, medical reimbursement, insurance reimbursement for some of these um, therapies that, some of these services that are done as therapies, as, um, equine assisted psychotherapy, physical therapy, uh, adaptive writing, which is sometimes uh, done um, uh, uh, in, in conjunction with a doctor who is uh, recommending such for cerebral palsy or uh, something like that. Yeah, and to start with your last example, adaptive writing or therapeutic writing is recreational in nature in the United States, but 
a medical doctor, like a family practitioner, may recommend that a person with a disability engage in something in a habit and, you know, like a habit, <laughs> like um, not rehabilitative, but habilitative. That's the emphasis, right? So this is my third language. Um, the the um, that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> that in a in a habilitative manner, meaning that you know, it could bring some of those general experiences that I mentioned in that slide with like movement and exercise and relationship and working toward goals, and that they really add to quality of life. And sometimes that movement, even just in a non-medical setting uh, can just be good for the body, just like adaptive tennis or adaptive swimming. So, you know, adaptive riding in the United States is not a healthcare service because it's not provided as such. And it's really recreational activities with horses done by instructors. And I'm one of those instructors uh, trained and credentialed in that particular area. But when we talk about healthcare services, and this, your, the way you asked the question was really good because it really shows how tricky it gets conceptually when we're talking about this. Because if we're talking about a therapy or a service separate from, let's say, what a mental health professional uh, bills for, no matter if you're a mental health counselor or a clinical social worker or a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner or a psychiatrist or a clinical psychologist, I'm just rattling off mental health professions in the United States who can access the codes in the current procedural terminology manual, the CPT manual. Those are the little uh, numbers that people use to code to indicate what their treatment services are. And all those professions that I mentioned all use the same codes when they use psychotherapy as treatment. So psychotherapy is that service. Same on, let's say, speech therapy, speech language pathology. They have a code set that is only available to those who are qualified to use it, typically speech language pathologists, um, who then use that code set. And, and on all, all professions that I mentioned, mental health, occupational, physical, and speech language, physical therapists have a little bit of variation, but the other professions bill for time as opposed to for each individual thing that happens in a therapy session. And this means that the master's or doctoral level provider of occupational therapy, of psychotherapy, that they have some guidance from their practice standards of what they need to do to add something new to their treatment scope, you know, or their scope remains, but an area of competency within that. And that there's some autonomy in how a, again, clinical psychologist conceptualizes the treatment arc within the confines of their practice standards. But you can apply a mindfulness technique apply an insight-based technique, you know, apply different tools and techniques within your work. And interactions with horses is one of those many tools and techniques. And it is not the separate treatment. That treatment can be cognitive behavioral. It can be trauma-specific. It could be psychodynamic. You know, I'm rattling off again a number of, of, of terms that are are, exist in the world of psychotherapy. So if you're a therapist who provides psychotherapy and you do so following those principles, you don't say, oh, I'm not doing psychotherapy now. I'm doing horse therapy or equine assisted therapy and then do something completely different than you would. You become a different person. That would be difficult. But if you're a therapist who are working, let's say with your typical CBT wheels and, and sequences, and you're including a horse to make that come alive, to ease the patient's mind, to increase insight, to have somewhere to practice, then you're doing psychotherapy, you bill for psychotherapy because it's one of the treatment techniques. And that's really how to conceptualize this. I apologize for taking such, such a long time to explain this, but it's a conceptual question. And because of misunderstandings, we do have a few states in the United States who don't allow Medicaid, this is state insurance uh, for folks of, of lower SES or lower income, that, that they cannot have equine movement as part of their treatment. 
And that has arisen. So there's been what's called an ex a hard exemption. And that's arisen because of a misunderstanding. And I would maybe carry that same misunderstanding if I was a, a payer of services, so such an insurance company. I'd say, no, please, we reimburse for physical therapy here, not for horseback riding. You can go do that at the bar. But as we learned, physical therapy that incorporates graded equine movement is not the same as a riding lesson by far. It really modulates the horse's movement. It uses it in small batches. It, you know, positions the client or the patient in certain ways to kind of, you know, make the most use of the neuromotor input. This is much different. But if I use the term horse therapy to mean physical therapy with equine interaction, that would be confusing. And that's why those, that there is that area of exemption there, but it arose out of a misunderstanding of services. So we're not trying to make just horses generally, like my horses back here and I go out to them and I say, oh, I should get reimbursed because I therapized myself with my horses, you know, or something like that. It's not that way. It's really about professionalizing and looking at this as professional tools and individual tools and techniques are not specifically graded within your reimbursement. That's very helpful and uh, answers a number of questions. It, it certainly demonstrates um, one, um, uh, one of many reasons why terminology is so important um, in, in terms of communication, but also in terms of uh, showing what is, is really going on, um, the physical therapy, the occupational therapy, versus the, uh, the horse element. Um, I think we've taken more than uh, advantage of your time with us. So I, I don't want to uh, ask any more questions or go beyond. Uh, I um, thoroughly enjoyed this uh, program. Uh, again, I think we learned uh, uh, quite a lot from your talk and greatly appreciate the time that you spent with us. No, oh, it's been wonderful to be here. And I know again, biotherapy does encompass interactions with other animals. And I'm always curious uh, about all the areas of biotherapy. So um, really a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you. Albert, we'll, uh, we'll end here, right? Yes. And no in other a questions. couple of days, we should have uh, the recorded session posted on YouTube and Facebook. Thank you again, uh, and thank you to, to everyone out there. Bye-bye. <laughs>